Good morning to all of you. It is uh, my pleasure to chair this session of uh, the section control and optimization of the ICM 2022. Our first lecturer today is Professor Regina Sandra Buracic. Uh, Regina is an Argentinian mathematician working now at the University of South Australia. She got a PhD in IMPA in Rio de Janeiro back in 1995, and uh, she is uh, internationally renewed for con her contributions to convex analysis. Today, her lecture will be on the topic of enlargements, a bridge between maximal monotonicity and convexity. Uh, I am afraid that Regina today is not available. She was traveling, so she sent her apologies for the, you know, the audience. Uh, we are, however, lucky that uh, we got her um, record, so you will be able to, we will be able to watch uh, this video, and then uh, uh, for questions, please uh, use the platform Discord that is available on the ICM webpage or the ECM webpage, we will not be able to interact here, okay? So we will listen to Regina and in the end I will close the session. Questions please in this in this call. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure to have Regina today talking about enlargements of bridge between maximal qualities. Thank you very much, Regina. Thank you, thank you. It's a great honor for me to be standing here and being able to tell you the story about how maximally monotone operators, which are an important object in inverse problems, can be related with convex functions. So I will start by the preliminary, giving a description of all the ingredients of this talk. And a main ingredient in this talk is, of course, convex functions and how you go from convex functions to maximally monotone operators. So if we can imagine a river on one side of the river, the convex functions on the other side, maximally monotone operators, and the idea is how to go there. So the idea is that if you have a maximally monotone operator T, you can construct a family of enlargements, which we will call E of T, which is in a one-to-one -one bijective correspondence with a whole family of convex functions. So there is some kind of uh, trinity here or triangle that allows to go from maximally monotone operators to convex functions by means of a new object that you, has to be constructed by adding a new dimension to the original problem. So this is this will be the main part of my talk. And in the end, I will tell about an application of the family of convex functions, which is actually called the Fitzpatrick family today. And I will explain you why and how this family can be used to define a whole new family of distances between point to set maps of which one of them is maximally monotone. And then a short application to different difference of convex problems, how to use these distances to characterize global solutions of difference of convex problems. So how, how does everything start? So you have what is called an inclusion problem. An inclusion problem involves a point to set mapping, T, which goes from a reflexive Banach space, capital X, to its dual, X star. But if you are not familiar with the structure of Banach spaces, you can think of Rn. Both of these sets can be Rn in this case. And the interesting thing about T is that T is set value. So T of X is not a point, but it is a subset of the dual space. Therefore, becomes the uh, expression inclusion problem, which consists of given a Z, which is your data, your information in the dual space, you need to find an X in the primal space such that Z is an element of the set T of X. And in this talk, we will use this connection between this problem and the classical Fermat optimality condition that if point X is a solution of an optimization problem, if and only if you have that zero is equal to the gradient of F. So the classical Fermat condition is 
a particular case of the inclusion problem when, when you have a point-to-point -point mapping and that mapping is the gradient of a function f. But how do you solve this problem? How do you go about solving these problems? Because maximally monotone operators are complex, complex objects. So what do you need to understand is you need to have an idea of how to look at the graph of the operator in a way which allows you to solve an approximation of the original problem. So you take the graph of T and you say, OK, I need to, to find an X such that given this Z, which is prescribed to me, I can find the pair XZ in the graph such that I can find the pair XZ in the graph. That's, that's it. So you need to understand the graph to be able to solve the inclusion problem, sometimes also called inverse problem, because from Z you need to go to X. Another problem which also motivate, motivates the study of maximally monotone operators is the variation and inequality problem. So in the same way as the inclusion problem is the generalization of the classical Fermat condition, which is unconstrained optimization problem. So the inclusion problem generalizes the unconstrained optimization problem. The variational inequality problem generalized the convex constrained optimization problem. So this is exactly here the optimality condition for convex constrained optimization problems in which you have a convex set C, a set valued mapping T in the same way as you have in the inclusion problem. But this time you need to find an element XV in the graph again. So the graph again has an important role such that the vector V times any direction that goes inward the set forms a positive angle. And that's exactly the condition of constrained convex optimization. So two main problems in convex analysis motivate the study of maximally monotone operators by looking at the generalization of those two problems. But variational inequalities itself uh, have an importance independently from optimization. They are used as models for certain PDEs or for equilibrium problems, etc. So they are really a fundamental object in functional analysis. Therefore, it is important to be able to relate or to translate these problems in terms of convex functions, because you have a whole family of tools that come from convex analysis that allow you to deal with a convex problem. So if you could translate these problems into some, some convex framework, then you would be able to, to address these problems in a, in a way which was not prone which, which uh, in a way that you would not be able to solve it if you stay within the maximally monotone operator framework. So let me just recall you again. So what is the graph? I mentioned the graph shortly before. So the graph are all the pairs x, x stars, that are x star is an element of the set T of x. But the set T of x can be anything. So it can be empty or not empty. So when the set is not empty, those are the good points. And those, those points are called the elements in the domain of T. So this is part of classical set valued mappings, has nothing to do with maximally monotone operators. So what is a maximally monotone operator? A monotone operator, without being maximal, is an operator such that whenever you take two elements in the graph and you multiply them, in this case, I'm using the duality product in the primal space X times the dual space X star, Right, but you can think of about the scalar product in Rn, so that the multiplication of the the increment in one variable times this times the increment in the images is non-negative. So this is clearly a generalization of increasing functions from R to R, in which this is the typical product, and you have simply uh, t minus s times f of t minus f of s greater than or equal to zero for every t and s, right? So this is the generalization of increasing functions. And this is why these operators are called monotone. Now, if you have too many points, sorry, if you have too many points in the, in the graph, you may destroy this, this uh, monotonicity condition. So you, it, 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 there comes a moment in which you cannot add more points uh, without destroying the monotonicity 
the monotonicity condition with respect to some other point of the graph. This means that you have to consider maximal uh, graphs in the sense that you cannot add any more points to the graph of T without destroying this maximality condition. So think about an increasing curve from R to R. If that increasing curve has a hole, then that operator is not maximal. If you fill all the holes so that you have a continuous increasing hole in R to R, then increasing curve from increasing curve that gives you a maximal a maximal uh, monotone map. So this uh, maximal monotone maps not only uh, generalize non-decreasing functions from R to R, but mainly the idea is that they they generalize derivatives of convex functions, but also non-positive uh, semi-definite linear maps, uh, etc. So they are useful objects. I hope that I convince you about this. And probably the first, the 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 this the, the, the concept of maximally monotone operator can be traced back to Goulomb. A, a German mathematician who had to escape the Nazi uh, times, and he went to the US. And then it was rediscovered independently by Sarantonello, an Argentinian mathematician who used it for solving functional equations. But the person who really established the fundamental properties of maximally monotone operators and really gave them the position it has to have in functional analysis was Minty in the 60s. So I recommend his papers, very beautiful. Now, we have been speaking all the time about maximally monotone operators. Now let's go to the other side of the river about convex functions. So how do you go from convex functions to maximally monotone operators? So what is essentially just for those who are not familiar, if convex function is if you take the graph and you take the whole set above the graph, if that set has to be convex, and if that set is also closed, then you say that your function is lower semi-continuous. So this function, the functions that we are going to consider in this talk can attain the value plus infinity. And the points at which you don't attain that value, they are called the domain of the function, are, we assume that that set is not empty. So the, the, there, is, there is some something above the graph of the, of the function f. OK. so. The way in which we go to maximally monotone operators is that we take an object which is which is a set valued map that goes from x to x star, which is called the subdifferential. The subdifferential is fundamental in convex analysis because it provides you a way of somehow working with the derivative when your function is not differentiable. So that's the main. That's probably the main reason for which convex analysis is important, because you can work with functions which are not differentiable as if they were differentiable by using this beautiful object, which is the subdifferential. So what is the subdifferential? OK, in the same in the same way as the classical derivative, what is the classical derivative? The classical derivative is the slope of a tangent to the graph of of your function, right? So in the, in the same way, the subdifferential gives you all the slopes that are tangent to the graph of your function. So they are, the, are the, all the slopes such that the function is greater than the first order Taylor approximation around x with slope x star. So this is exactly the subdifferential. And note that we are going to use the fact that the subdifferential is defined by an inequality. This is this is going to be important. Of course, if f of x is plus infinity, this set is empty and the subdifferential is empty. So the the way to cross the river, I was telling you, is was done by Rockefeller in 1970. He showed that actually this subdifferential is maximally monotone. And what is very interesting is that in order to show this, he he had to add a new dimension into the problem. He had to enlarge this subdifferential. He had to look at it, let's say, from above, and so that, that he was able then to prove this fundamental theoretical property of the subdifferential itself. And what is that, uh, that, that, that way? What, what did he do? He enlarged the subdifferential, and we, 
because the subdifferent the, the, the enlargement is a point to set map, I will um, denote it with this U on top just to distinguish it from the classical subdifferential. And it's a point to set map. And the, the, the dimension, the additional dimension that he he uh, he placed was this epsilon positive. So he this point to set map goes from a pair epsilon x to a subset. And in this, to define this subset, he did, he did as follows. He said, okay, my subdifferential is defined by this inequality. So if I if I relax this inequality by using this epsilon, I will have in this set, I will have in this set all the elements in the subdifferential plus something more. And the the great the, the larger is this epsilon the larger will be my my set so this is what we call here in this talk the Brosted and Rockefeller enlargement but usually in convex analysis this is called the epsilon enlargement I will not use this notation here because I don't want to use the epsilon as a fixed uh, I don't want to fix the epsilon the epsilon is a variable here so that's why I call it for Bronsted and Rockefeller who introduced this enlargement in 1965 and then Rockefeller used this enlargement to prove the maximal monotonicity of the subdifferential. So this is this is how he went from uh, from convex functions to maximally monotone operators. And the key to do that was to enlarge the original operator. Now the two main properties of this enlargement are, of course, it enlarges because of its very definition for every epsilon. And when epsilon grows, the set grows. But the most important property is the fact that you can, you know how to construct new elements in this graph. So you have some kind of kind of manual that allows you to construct new elements of the graph by using complex combination of other elements in the graph. And note that this property is not true for the subdifferential itself, because the graph of the subdifferential is not convex. However, there is some idea of convexity. I will explain to you the details later, but there is some idea of convexity associated with the graph of this enlargement. Okay, so now let me go back. Where are we? We are on the other the side of the river of the maximally monotone operators and the enlargements, right? Now we want we want to go back. We want to go back to convex functions. And what is the key to do that? The key to do that is what we uh, is a function that we will mention a lot in this talk is the Fenchel-Young function. The Fenchel-Young function uses the information on the original function f, but also uses the information on a new function defined on the dual space. Because actually, if we want to translate a subset of x times x star, which is the graph of my enlargement or the graph of my operator, that's a subset of x times x star. So we need more information. We, we cannot work with only information on x. We need also information on, on x star. And for that, we use the facial conjugate of the function f, which is a function that goes from x star to a r union infinity. And at any v on x star is the supremum of all the difference the, all the differences between the linear function defined by v and my function f of x. This is called the Fenchel conjugate, and it's a classical tool in convex analysis. And then using the function f plus the function f star, we produce something that will be with us during this whole talk, which is called the Fenchel Young system. The Fenchel Young system has to, is a, is, um, it comes from a Fenchel Young inequality, which is the, the inequality on the first line, which comes directly from the definition of F star. So there is no secret about this, this first line. But what is interesting is that using the properties of the subdifferential and its maximality, you can show that equality only happens when you are standing in the graph of the subdifferential. This means that you can fully translate the information on the graph of this maximally monotone operator, the subdifferential, into the convex function language by saying, okay, I'm in the graph. If when I compute this left hand side, I get equal, I get something which is equal to the product. So this is the way in which you can translate 
all the information corresponding to the graph of a maximally monotone operator in terms of convex functions. And this justifies calling the function in the left hand side the Fenchel Young function, which, as I tell you, characterizes. And in this way, we go from maximally monotone operators to convex functions by the Fenchel Young system. Okay, so, but it, this is not only, this is not the only part of the story. Not only we can characterize the graph of the maximally monotone operator, but we can characterize also the graph of the enlargement. Okay, why? Because you can control how much you violate this inequality. So if you violate this inequality by less than epsilon, so if you are in this situation, then you are in a set which contains your subdifferential but contains also other points. And in fact, all the points that it contains are the points in the Bronsted and Rockefeller enlargement. So this, in this way, you can use this convex function, the Fenchel Young function, not only to characterize the subdifferential, but also to characterize the enlargement. So now we fully went to the other side of the river. But let me mention that not only the the enlargement, the bronze rockefeller enlargement was used to prove fundamental theoretical properties of the subdifferential, like maximal monotonicity, but it's also used to define efficient methods for solving non smooth optimization problems and also to characterize approximate solutions of non smooth optimization problems. And one of the reasons for which it's so efficient is the, co the continuity properties that this enlargement has as a set value map, which the subdifferential itself does not enjoy. So this is how, the, so we went all the way back. So we started with a convex function and we went all the way back to the Fenchel Young function via an enlargement, via the Bronsted and Rockefeller enlargement. So now, all this up to now is in the, framework of convex functions. What happens when you have, a, when you start with a maximally monotone operator T? And again, the key to go from this maximally monotone operator to convex function is going to be the Fenchel Young function again. But let me, uh, let me explain to you first, so how, how, how did Rockefeller went from convex functions to to prove that the subdifferential is maximally monotone. He needed to define the Bronsted and Rockefeller enlargement. So the same we need to do with the maximally monotone operator. So remember that the, the, the monotonicity property require, required a certain inequality to be greater than or equal to zero. If you relax that inequality by, by minus epsilon, then you get more points in the set. So for a fixed, epsilon and for a fixed x, you consider the set of all the v's in E star such that with respect to any other point in the graph, you have that this property holds. Of course, if epsilon is zero, you recover t of x because t is maximal. But if epsilon is positive, you have more points than t of x. And this is the enlargement we are going to look at in the, in the, next, in the next slides. This was uh, what was obtained together with you, Simmons Weiter, in 97. So now it's uh, the 25th birthday, it's a full adult object. And it has two, the same two properties that the Bronsted and Rockefeller enlargement has. So it enlarges the set T of X, and when epsilon grows, the set grows. But moreover, and this is important, there is a transportation formula that allows you again to construct elements in the graph of TE by by combining in a convex way other elements in the graph of TE. And also, again, in the same way as the Bronsted Rockefeller enlargement is used for applications in algorithms and characterizing optimality conditions, in the same way the TE is also used for algorithms for variational inequality problems and for approximation of the inclusion problem. But the interesting thing, and now here this comes a, a different part of the story, TE is not the only element 
that satisfies these three properties, E1, E2, and E3. There is actually a whole family of mappings that satisfy the same properties, E1 and E2. So there is a whole family of point-to-set maps that also go from R plus times X to X star that satisfy the same properties and also satisfy what is called the transportation formula. The transportation formula, which I'm showing to you here for the first time, I told you that you take two points in the graph and then you take two convex coefficients and you combine the x's by those convex coefficients and the v's also. And then you need to find the epsilon such that you can fit that v star into E of epsilon bar X bar. Not every epsilon is good. If you take the convex combination and add this correcting term, then Zweiter showed in 2000 that this epsilon bar is non-negative, this is important, and V bar belongs to the image via E of E bar X, X bar. So this, this uh, family was introduced by Zweiter in the year 2000, it has a very nice structure. And what we are going to see is that the element TE that I showed to you before has a very important role in this family. It's actually the biggest possible enlargement that satisfies these three properties, E1, E2, and E3. So this was proved together with Zweiter in 2002. And now, let me go back. We are fully on on the side of the river of the maximally monotone operators and the enlargements, we haven't touched any convex function yet. So how do we go back to convex functions? Again, the key to this convex function that I was, uh, the key to go to convex functions is the Fenchel-Young function. So just let me remind you the two main properties of the Fenchel-Young function. So it's equal to this to the product when you are in the graph of the subdifferential and less than the product plus epsilon when you are in the graph of the enlargement. So what we want is to find a convex function G which has exactly the same properties, but not with respect to the subdifferential of F and this, the Bronsted and Rockefeller enlargement, but with respect to T and TE. And that this bridge was, was crossed by Simon Fitzpatrick, a brilliant mathematician, Australian mathematician from Perth, who in 1988, well before TE existed, in fact, um, in 1988, he defined what is now called the Fitzpatrick function. And I, I'm uh, visiting him in 2004. He defined this uh, Fitzpatrick function, and the Fitzpatrick function satisfies all the properties that I have showed to you before by the very definition is larger than the scalar than the product it's equal to the product if and only if you are you, your pair xv is in the graph of t and if you can control the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side by this epsilon then you are in the graph of te so let's note that this te was created in 1997 and ft in 1988 so and the paper, the seminal paper by Simon Fitzpatrick, does not have does not mention enlargements. He also he also concentrates on convex functions. And this uh, this this paper is uh, fundamental, and it's used to it's used for solving problems in variational analysis, and uh, for solving some problems that um, have to do with partial differential equations. And these problems, you were not able to solve this by using convex analysis. And the theory that comes out from using this function is now called the Fitzpatrick theory. But again, in the same way as it was happening with the TE enlargement, the Fitzpatrick function is not the only one that satisfies these properties. In fact, Fitzpatrick himself in his paper, he showed that there is a whole family of such convex functions, and, and that, of course, FT is one of them. But moreover, he also showed that every other element in this family, and this is very beautiful, every other element in this family is greater than the Fitzpatrick function. So the Fitzpatrick function is the smallest element, 
And the biggest element is the Fenchelian conjugate of that function. So every element is between those two functions. So it has a very beautiful structure. Now, let's go to the connection between these uh, two families that I have shown to you. So we have an operator T, and we have the family of enlargements, and then we have the family of convex functions. Are they connected in some way? So the beautiful fact is that they are in a bijective correspondence, and this bijective correspondence is order reversing in the following sense. So you map an H into an enlargement. An enlargement is a point to set map, which we will call LH. And how does LH behave? It goes from R plus times X to X star, and LH of epsilon X is equal to the Vs in X star, such that, and here, remember the Fenchel-Yang inequality, H of XV is less than the product XV plus epsilon. So this gives you the definition of the enlargement. And so this is the way for you to go from H of T to ET. And you can show that this is a bijection. So for every convex function in, in Fitzpatrick family, there is a corresponding enlargement in the family. In particular, when that convex function is a Fitzpatrick function, it goes to TE. So this is this is uh, so there is some kind of duality between those the, these two objects. Okay, so now let's go to the last part of the of of the talk in which I will mention an application of these convex functions. So in 2018 together with Juan Enrique Martinez Legas, we defined a new family of Bregman distances by means of this family HT. And I will show you, it's a very natural idea. And then together with Mindao and, and Scott Lindstrom, we worked on the theoretical and computational properties of these distances. Now, let me remind you what is the Bregman distance. The Bregman distance is, again, a beautiful object, was introduced by Bregman in 1967, and he introduced it for a strictly convex and, and smooth function. And it's an object that, if you look at it, there is nothing that is more convex that, that, than that object. So you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't guess how to relate it to something which is different than convex functions. So what is the, this, this object? is simply the difference between the function and any of its linear approximations. And because the function is convex, then this difference, this uh, distance is greater than or equal to zero if and only if the function is convex. So there is convexity inherent into the definition of a Bregman distance. But where do you find the maximally monotone operators by looking at this definition. When you translate this expression, which is the Bregman distance, in terms of the fenchel young function and use the properties of the fenchel young function, you see that this expression here is nothing but the fenchel young function at the point x gradient of f of y. So this is simply the, the difference between the fenchel young function between two vectors and the product of those two vectors. And by the properties of, when you look at the properties of the, of the by the system, by the Fenchelian system, you can show very easily that this distance is zero, not if X is equal to Y, which is what actually holds if your function is strictly convex. But if your function is not strictly convex, this is zero if and only if the gradient of f at x, so this point here should be gradient of f at x, should be in the graph of the gradient for this difference to be zero. So this is a distance in the dual space, and one of the terms on this expression is an element of the Fitzpatrick family. And that, that observation takes you to maximally monotone operators. Okay, you take the Fitzpatrick family, which satisfies this uh, fits this uh, fenchel young system and now you just have to take the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side but you have to be careful 
because this V here can be anywhere in T of Y for you to replicate the properties of the Bregman distance. And because T of Y is a set, then it might you might even take the supremum or the infimum over T of Y. And each of these definitions gives you a different type of distance. So the sharp version is if you take the supremum, the flat one if you take the infimum, and of course, for every age in the family, you have a different type of distance. And you would say, okay, why? what do we do with this? The first observation is what I told you before, is that these distances generalize the classical Bregman distance. So Bregman distance is a particular case of this distance. If your operator is the gradient and you choose as the element in the Fitzpatrick family, you choose the Fenchel Young function, then you recover, then everything collapses into the Bregman distance. So you can see that by, by looking at the enlargements, you can take a single object in the, in the convex framework and extend it to a whole family of those objects. In particular, for a, an arbitrary maximally monotone operator, you can take T you, like, you can take H, the Fitzpatrick distance, and you again obtain two new distances using the Fitzpatrick function. But you can go a little bit further, right? Because in your definition, you take the supremum and the infimum over T of Y, and this here, up to here, we, are, we have a fixed maximally monotone operator T. But this supremum, you can take it on any set, in fact. And you can think that you have one maximally monotone operator so that you have HT in the family, in the Fitzpatrick family, but the set over which you take the infimum or the supremum can be in the image of any point to set map. You don't need structure there. So this gives us a distance between two set valued maps. And, and then you would say, okay, what are these distance measuring really? These distances are measuring the level of overlap between the set S of Y and the set T of X. And I want to remind you that many optimality conditions in variational analysis are expressed in terms of intersection of sets that then a certain intersection has to be non-empty or, or stronger even, some set has to be a subset of another. So those two kinds of overlaps are very important in variational analysis, and these distances characterize them. So the flat distance characterizes the not empty intersection, and the sharp distance characterizes the inclusion. So you can express this in terms of a distance. And of course, in the case in which S is equal to T and it's point to point, and it's equal to the gradient, then you recover the result that I showed you before, that the Bregman distance is zero, if and only if the gradients coincide at X and Y. Now, just to, to finish, I will show how to use one of these distances and, and this general type of distance with a general S of Y, which is not maximally monotone, how to use this to characterize solutions of difference of convex problems. So let me remind you, you have, the dif you have two convex functions and you want to minimize the difference. This is a non-convex problem. So it's a, it's a non-convex problem, uh, but it has a very interesting structure because you know that F and G are convex. And it is, it is a, well known in finite dimensions that you can characterize a global minimum of a difference of, of convex functions by using this type of inclusion as in what I was showing to you before. So this is an optimality condition for difference of convex function. So what is this optimality condition? You take, because G and F are convex, you can take the Bronsted and Rockefeller enlargement of each of them at epsilon, and then if you have that this inclusion is true for every epsilon positive, then you have a global solution of your original non-convex problem, which is a, a beautiful result. It's well known in finite dimensions. And for the case of reflexive Banach spaces, because we couldn't find it, we proved it together with uh, Ming Dao and Scott Lindstrom in 2022. But what is interesting is that this optimality condition 
can be written because of the result that I have just shown to you in terms of the new distances that we obtain. So in this new distance, the set T is the subdifferential of F, maximally monotone, and the map S is the Bronsted and Rockefeller enlargement of G at a fixed epsilon. And this mapping is not maximally monotone. So this means that we really need to have something which is not necessarily maximally monotone over which to take the infimum and the supremum to be able to, to cover this case. The, the conclusions, I hope that I convince you that convex functions arise naturally in the study of maximally monotone operators. And moreover, you can go back from maximally monotone operators to convex functions. And the key to do that is using the Fitzpatrick function and the Fitzpatrick family. And independently of that, you can define a family of enlargements, which is in bijective correspondence with the Fitzpatrick function. And because of the fenchel yang system, they univocally define the original operator T. So you can translate problems that are formulated in terms of T in terms of convex functions. And even notions that you couldn't think of a way of going from that notion to maximally monotone operators, like the Breckman distance, can surprise you because you may find in that expression something that can connect you with maximally monotone operators. OK, thank you very much. This is all. What do I think? about the next step? Well, they, this is a very good question. I, I think that when I look at some object which, which comes from convex analysis, I think that now we have a lot of elements that allow us to look at that, convex, at that object from above and try to see, OK, where, where can I find the connection between this object and convex functions. So I would I would look at a complex problem involving let's say mac, involving convex functions and related with maximally monotone operators, and obtain new results about convex functions, which is what we did here for characterizing characterizing a global solution of of difference of convex problems. So I think that. Uh, Finding these connections between these two important areas, finding more connections between these two important areas is, it, for me, it's fun. I mean, I, I, when, I, when I do something, I don't think about what is important. I would think about what is really fascinating and what, what can lead you to something which is really interesting and exciting. Thank you for this talk. As we said before, uh, for questions and comments, you can use the Discord uh, platform. And uh, I'm sure that our speaker, um, Regina Sandra Buracic, will be very happy to interact with you on these topics. Thank you again. It was very, it was a great pleasure to 